survey uh, of you know females between the age of 25 to 35 for just lotto who have a car loan and have two kids we can select just that segment from the data set and send surveys to them thanks okay. all right i'm gonna take another and if i could just comment there you know on data collection the jamaica chamber of commerce has been doing a business and consumer survey for the last maybe 18 or 19 years i think we do 100 business for the business confidence and 600 consumers and in the middle of our q1 which ended in march the COVID thing came up and it, 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 there was a challenge in, in reaching the 600 you know at that time and i mean the, the amount that we got was just the 600 but um were able to i think there was only about a two percent variance in the confidence of the survey but what it does it puts in a new dimension yeah. that has looked forward and i think for political polls too it's going to become a reality you know as our election is due early 2021 in that they are going to sit back now and say boy how am i going to get to the consumer because i can't have square parties in some shop or wherever how am i going to do the surveys because things like you know blue that i'm sure have is like survey monkey where you have online servicing that one can do so uh, again the whole landscape is going to change and you have to think outside of the box and how am i going to operate in this new normal and this this next question might actually bring paris right into the mix of things uh, we haven't heard from him yet keisha keisha a anderson is asking is data analytics used in government is it applicable i don't know if you want to take that one paris and then we'll dive right into I think uh, I'll take the, pre the, the question in my presentation. It, 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 right. It's point blank. Uh, I answer that question in the presentation. Okay, one second. So I'm going to come back to you then. Um, and it also answers Keisha's other question as well in terms of unstructured data. Right, okay, good, good, good. So, but let me take this one from Amanda. How do you bridge the gap where your target customers are not technologically savvy? But you are uh, unable to connect with right. it. Right. So, good question, Amanda, and thank you for asking that question. So, what we have is, we, I think we're probably the only, well, definitely the only company that can now um, offer nationally representative studies in the manner in which we do. What we have is a mix of both online and offline. So, in addition to the online database of over 6,000 Jamaicans, and that, that number grows daily, um, we have 4,000. Uh, Jamaicans that we call, you know, for, who, are, who represent the offline side of the the panel, and those those four thousand Jamaicans are all across all sectors, um, demographics, so rural, um, lower income, middle income, um, older people who aren't technologically savvy, etc. And so what we do is we do a mixed methodology. And So we're going to jump. Thank you so much for participating. And you know, keep the questions coming. We're going to grab them and um, keep them. Uh, we're going to jump to Paris now. And um, Paris, you know, to the uninitiated, it may seem easy to, it's easy to see how the data you capture are good for figuring out the where of a solution, just as we mentioned earlier, in terms of the PSOJ thing, and addressing some social issue, figuring out, you know, where to find people, you know, when they were trying to determine the most vulnerable. But um, could a business use informatics for its survival during and after COVID? And what exactly is geoinformatics? Right. Thank you. Thank you, um, Kalando. The, and good afternoon, everyone. Geoinformatics is really about answering the question where. So when you look at at how to determine vulnerable communities what does vulnerable communities actually mean um, we need to be able to determine um, how to direct resources how to, to, to focus a response activity um, you, you you we mentioned in this in this discussion about st thomas and obia but i can assure you that not all of st thomas is uniformly obia so we have to be able to determine how do you move in a particular area how is port moran different from yalas different from Pa? different from from Albion and so on. So we have to be able to understand and scale down um, within particular areas how particular um, dynamics and things work. We're talking about urban versus rural. We're talking about coastal versus inland. We're talking about tourist areas versus uh, industrial areas versus commercial areas versus uh, straight up residential areas. We're talking about residential areas that are high income, residential areas that are low income. It's very, it's very um, spatial how all of this uh, operates. 
However, one of the things I wanted to, to, to bring the discussion in, in, in this afternoon, Larry and Larry have spoken about the business focus and the use of business data. But what I wanted to, 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 to take you through is, to, is, the, is the data environment that we're operating in. Uh, so if I could ask um, the next slide to be um, brought up. So a few years ago, we had the, the first zone of special operations set in uh, Mount Salem in Montego Bay, and there was a big hue and cry about the definitions and issues and so on. And again, if you could see the front page of the Gleaner on the left, it says here, Security Council had me data blunder. Now let me explain to you what happened here. Next slide, please. There are three Mount Salems, right? If you look at the slide on the top right, that's the Mount Salem Police Station Response Area, right? The, the, the red area you see on the bottom right and in the, on, the, on the left, that is the Mount Salem Zone of Special Operation. And on the left you see a blue circle enveloping the, um, the red circle. That's the Mount Salem Police Station that covers an area larger than the community of Mount Salem and certainly larger than the Mount Salem Zone of Special Operation. That's spatial. Data is data is data except when it's not. Right, so we have to understand the role of scale and geoinformatics in defining this. Next slide, please. We, you, we, we are, as a community, we're very used to jumping to conclusions, having anecdotal, reactive types of conclusions without the use of evidence. Uh, last year, we had a situation in, um, in Hanover, where on the left is the newspaper report where it quotes the superintendent saying, from all indication, it was as a result of speeding. Yet the formal report says here that the driver of the gray Toyota Corolla motor car lost control for reasons unknown. Okay, so we've jumped to a conclusion before ascertaining the facts. Next slide, please. We have a situation here where we're talking about a death by neglect. A policeman died in St. Catherine. All of the reporting does not once mention the fact that the police station, policeman was driving a taxi. Right? All of these things are very important in terms of trying to define what it is we're trying to define. And one of the things that we capture a lot, whether it's going to be um, crimes or it's going to be uh, traffic incidents, we talk about crime and murder and we talk about traffic incidents as traffic fatalities. On the right of what you're seeing right now, you're seeing six injured in a motor vehicle crash on Spanish Road. You see 20 how many people injured in, a, in, in Grand Spain Road in um, St. Thomas. Nobody died. And as a result, these are not in the system being recorded and analyzed and, 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 and predicted. So if you go to the next slide, when you look at the total cost of violence, as we did, we mined hospital records to get not just the people who die. People who die cost the hospital system the least. It's people who are severely injured for the rest of their lives that incur significant costs. And we mined the hospital records to determine cost of x-rays, cost of ICU, cost of blood, cost of um, pharmaceuticals, and, and, and so on. All of this adding up to unintentional injury costs in Jamaica amounting to $12.6 billion per year, the vast majority of which are non-fatal. Next slide, please. All of the, and then you, you break it down. When you, when you are a, a, a motorcycle um, injury, you cost an average of $263,000 per incident. Whereas if you were in a car, it's a lot less. If you were stabbed versus you were shot, there's a, lot, there's a, there, there's a difference in terms of, 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 of cost of treatment and therefore cost to society and so on. All of these are in theme. The first reaction, again, is that we need more ambulances, we need whatever, whatever, whatever. The justification of this study was to promote prevention rather than care. Sure, care is very important, but if you spend the same amount of money preventing people from getting injured, the, 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 the cost benefit is, is, is a lot better here, the return on investment is a lot better here. Next slide, please. Then we have stuff like this where a curfew imposed in sections of August Town. And the boundary is defined by an imaginary line for approximately 471 meters, um, blah, 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 to the steep corner on the hillside. What am I supposed to do with that? You're supposed to, 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 to measure 471 meters to the steep corner on the hillside? This is 2020, and this is how we're defining space, and this is how decisions are being made. 
based on descriptions. Next slide, please. We have CCTV camera systems all over. These form part of what's called Jamaica Eye. And we're, we're bagging that this thing is really good in solving crime, but it can't solve the fact that people are parking on a yellow line routinely in Barbican Square. You can see this, we can see this, police can see this, this is technology here. But it means nothing if you don't do something about it. So the point is investments in technology are nice and fancy. Collecting data is all nice and fancy unless you do something with, the, with, 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 with all the components here. I use the analogy of a cake right now. Cake is made up of flour, eggs and whatever. That's the ingredients, that's data, right? Technology is the oven or whatever you're going to use to cook the cake. The recipe is how you put all the pieces together. And you have to have the chef to, 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 to make this masterpiece here. We are focusing and people are trying to sell us ovens. And we are here collecting flour. But we're not synthesizing all this information properly uh, in, in order to make proper and sound decision. Because sure, Jamaica I can solve crime and all that type of stuff, but it's not it's not it's not promoting the rule of law and, and, and reducing chaos right now where people are operating with impunity, um, whether or not they are on camera. Next slide please. We have a situation here where we see cops are against using station diaries, electronic station diaries, because as this article says here, at my age, I don't want to have to learn to type. This is the problem we're facing in terms of implementation of systems and really converting um, data into something useful. Next slide, please. This is something that is actually shocking. We, 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 we recall a few, uh, a, a year and a half ago about a rape of a, of a hotel guest. Um, and of course, they talk about background checks and whatever. This was in October 2018. We do data mining at Monage Informatics Institute, and we found this thing on Crime Stop Post on March 2. Same person, right? March 2, we got this way. We, we were we, we, we based on information that's out there. And then October, the same guy is wanted for, for, for rape. And again, this is out there. You don't need a police record or some kind of thing to just use and mine stuff out there in social media. Next slide, please. Now, as we as we move on, on COVID here, this is a problem we have with data and just interpretation of data. Um, this was a front page uh, graph in the Gleaner a couple of weeks ago, where for some reason, 75 is greater than 233 as you can see in that graph. Right? I have no idea who makes this graph and, and, and what numbers they use. It's because we're not a very numerate society. We don't understand numbers. We don't understand visualization of numbers. We don't understand the implications of having numbers and so on. So it's very important that we as a society talk about investments in STEM, being serious about it, talking about, about decision making using data in a real way, not, not lip service right now. Because as we've gotten more sophisticated, the market has gotten more sophisticated, we need to be very serious. I'm almost wrapping up now. Next slide, please. So Kalando spoke about the, the COVID um, response by the PSOJ. And then we built a, a very complex model using 22 different variables, hundreds of thousands of data points to, 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 to reference what's happening. And the key word here is vulnerable. We're not looking for the poorest community. We're looking for the most vulnerable community. And vulnerability includes poverty, sure, but it also includes people with comorbid situations, the diabetics, the hypertensives, the old people. We're also looking at the, the employment characteristics of an area. We're looking at whether or not an area um, has, has, has a, um, lots of, lots of um, register, uh, disabled people and so on. 22 different variables were used to, to combine here. A poor community may not have a lot of old people. So a more vulnerable community would be a community that has poor people and lots of old people. We're looking at population densities all together, not the kind of here is poor people, here is um, unemployed people, here is sick people, and you thought of how to put the pieces together. It's all wrapped up together, and we were able to determine the top 25 communities in Jamaica, and those are where the PSOJ response uh, activation has, has, has jumped in. We don't end, we end there, but the effort doesn't end there. So JDF has now taken over in identifying those top 25 and then doing using their logistics for distribution and, 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 and mobilizing resources into those particular community. This is not, this is not scattershot. This is not because I feel like I should do it. This is something that is very data driven. And, and uh, next slide please, this final slide. 
So these are the twenty. These are the all the vulnerable communities in Jamaica, and the red areas are the twenty-five communities. And it's not coincidental that, uh, especially if you look at St. Catherine, that those red areas in St. Catherine meet here. And it's the same thing we're seeing now in Anata Bay, Dover, and Enfield in St. Mary, where those quarantine communities are now squeezed, and then the vulnerability goes up. So thank you very much. All right. Thanks, thank that um, look at the. As you said, the ecosystem of data that we operate with here, we were able to look at a little bit of the medical side, road traffic, and then we ended up with some of the COVID stuff. And I want to ask a question here from someone um, about medical, even though, yeah, I'm going to go to the medical question first from uh, Heather McCoy. How can informatics assist a medical facility and help with strategic planning and forecasting? Very good. Thank you for that question. Um, the, 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 apart from the fact that I'm not a real doctor, um, the, the, the medical operations, just like any business operation here, we're talking whether it's a private medical, it's something we saw for the COVID response as well. Um, you, you look at the fact that when we're talking about the, in, in the event of a real emergency and a real outbreak, we have to deconcentrate the, 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 the cases on hospitals. We want to get the milder cases in the health centers right. and then you want people to go to see how, how can private medical centers offset that and then you can quarantine stay at home type of thing so that's the level of what the response would do but of course then and I'm sure you're going to be asking Larry this question later there are going to be issues of logistics how do you move people from point A to point B without infecting everybody in between right, right. we have seen we have seen the where issue come up long before before COVID where Jamaican people, and we, we did situations where we were analyzing pregnant women, um, that pregnant women would travel vast distances to go to their favorite doctor. We saw cases of people traveling from Chapleton, Clarendon, to uh, I think it was um, Hope Bay, or, 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 or this is Portland. They're traveling to Portland because their doctor is, in, is now in Portland. So you see those kind of things. How can you improve service delivery? Maybe that's a very good thing that that's, this is such a good doctor that has such a loyal patient. But we're talking a pregnant woman here. There's blood pressure checks can be, can, can be taken um, much, much closer. Um, we're talking about uh, how do you access services for people with sickle cell, um, people with diabetes and, 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 and chronic illnesses versus how do you address issues of pharmaceutical provisions and how do people um, do the people go to the nearest pharmacy to home or to work? All of these things are aware questions that, that, that geoinformatics is able to answer. In terms of the medical facility, and even with the break, I mean, a company like uh, Medical Disposables and so on who provide, the, they provide uh, equip, sir, um, supplies to these medical centers or hospitals and whatever their own routes of delivery of it. If there's an outbreak here, it's likely that, you know, these spaces are going to be overrun by people needing services and so the supplies might go so, you know, they are able to use that to say, well, okay, well, let's change our route and make sure that these these uh, medical facilities on this route are stocked in this way because now the demand for these particular things are going to be greater. Yeah. And, and, and these suppliers also have suppliers themselves. So there's a whole, I mean, not, not just in Jamaica, we're talking global global logistics and supply chains, right? Every, and, then, and then even drifting beyond uh, everything else, uh, we do have situations where environmental issues of drought, of hurricanes, all of these things are operating in this system that has a very strong um, spatial component. I can give you, if you don't mind, for an example. Yeah, yeah. Right. All right. I, I'm going to pick, just before you speak, Lauren, I do want the, um, Olivine to know that we're going to ask her a question. But yes, Lauren, respond. Right. And, and this supports um, Paris. I don't think I've told Paris this, this story before. But um, the first time I realized the, the power of data was I was working at a company that processes health insurance claims. And I, I remember several occasions looking at pharmacy transactions coming of, of jobs being dispensed. And I would say notice an, an, an increase in, in uh, flu medication being dispensed in Porto Rios. And I would immediately know to call my dad who lives in Montego Bay and tell him specifically to start taking vitamin C uh, uh, medication or vitamins because I knew based on data that, that flu would get to Montego Bay in two weeks. Wow. 
he would never listen to me, of course, but, but just being able to imagine the, the, the type of preventative um, medicine that the government could do if they were paying attention to to, to um, pharmacy dispensations and what drugs were being dispensed to spot an outbreak, a possible outbreak of the flu or dengue or, or any type of disease. Like that. Um, okay, so I'm going to take a question. Thanks, Lauren, from um, Heather McCord. No, not Heather. Um, Heather had a follow-up question to the medical facility question. She says, "My, um, what kinds of external data do you recommend would assist us um, in business development and planning external data?" She asked. Um, to who? To me, Lauren, Lauren. Uh, well, yeah, because it was it, it was a follow-up question to the informatics question about medical facilities. All right, so there are many, many different things. I mean, one of the key things, especially as it deals with chronic disease, um, we need to look at, we need to continue monitoring demographic patterns, trends of uh, old people, young people, trends of, 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 of lifestyle diseases, of fast food, of, um, of exercise, those type of elements that are going to be very important. Um, Larry gave a very important, um, um, that kind of stuff to help drive, to, to see what, what, what transactions are happening in certain areas. It's something, it's something that is, is very important. The information that you have is valuable, but there's also information outside there. And when you put them together, it really becomes, you know, gold. And, uh, and, and how this is leveraged as a data analytics business versus a data analytics consumer, uh, all of this has value that we need to be able to, to, to leverage properly. And, and an example of, of how Budat has collaborated with, with Paris um, to answer that question is there was a, a and you can come and chant in Paris, there was a, a pizza franchise that were considering coming into, into Jamaica and we we used secondary data that, um, or data that, that MGI has to, to be able to tell us the pizza the franchise exactly where to put their store or their franchise locations based on the traffic in the area, um, the amount of other area, uh, places of interest that were surrounding those particular areas. They had a particular interest in schools, so we were able to tell them um, within a five mile radius what schools were nearby. They had, uh, and there's crime data that were added to it, um, the general demographic data, and then Blue Dot went out and profiled the, 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 the people. Um, the to, to be able to arrive at a, a specific location or location set for them, um, specifically telling them if you put your stores here, then you will you will see X amount of customers um, either walking in or based on the traffic driving by here, and then we can have their attention on that. Okay, Alanda. Yes, Larry, go ahead. If I could comment here, you know, we spoke a little earlier about supply chain analytics. Yeah. I think any company, let you be a distributor or a retail outlet or a small shop, I mean, supply chain is really, really critical to, to make money to get the proper turnover of your goods and to get your goods into, into source, in, into the outlets. Now, if we take the example recently of the lockdown of um, Portmore or the St. Catherine area. Now, all distribution companies have a have their supply chain well planned, and this is done from the customer back. So, a customer will tell you that you can deliver on and then another distributor on a Tuesday in the morning, midday, and afternoon. So, the supply ch chain re really works well. Now, when they brought down and, and, and put the quarantine into St. Catherine, it, it would be reasonable to think that nobody was thinking of the supply of goods getting in because the back end of a supermarket is really pretty pure. You know, you, you can control the social distances and it works regularly. So by, by, by limiting, for example, supply chains of the distributors going into the, the and there was massive communication that had to go on because company A may have been delivering on a Monday and they can no longer deliver on a Monday. And the back end didn't really concern the front end, which was a concern of the consumers coming in. So I think in just looking, you know, when decisions are being made, and I think this is the same point that, you know, Paris and Larry was trying to make, is just don't look at it that you're trying to isolate it because people have to eat, you have to get food in. So if you really had persons who understand the logistical network going in, you didn't have to trouble 
the salesperson and the delivery trucks going into the 50 outlets in St. You could have left that alone and that was clean and just control the consumer going in. And then you would have had a much, much cleaner transition. And I believe that this is really where information and data is available. But if you're not in that space and understand how businesses work, you can bring down the shutters with good intention and you cause massive, massive disruption and fear. Another one is Coronation Market. Hundreds of thousands of people live downtown. And when they finish work, get on a bus, they go through, they get the ground provisions and they head home. When you lock a curry at five o'clock, they are in trouble, they don't have no food because they don't have the resources to buy two, three weeks of food. They buy the food, they go home and they cook. And this is why the, 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 the joint JCC, GMA, and PSOJ has made a recommendation move it till five o'clock in the morning and eight o'clock in the evening what that means is a seven to seven shift or it is no longer in trouble because somebody can't leave home at six to get there at seven it, they don't have water to take in public transportation in so the time. It, and the time so you know i think sometimes we have to and you know the truth is we were in a crisis and they didn't know but that's the importance of having people on your team that understands having somebody who runs a supermarket on the team so they know the you know how it works having somebody who runs a distribution company so they can understand the supply chain and the logistics because the fact is if the distributors are getting if the supermarket doesn't work the people are gonna start and then we have a, a new problem that we need to know right um okay larry larry we're gonna go back and i don't know if you're going to be able to make this point for uh olivine is that her name burke yep Christian, Not olivine burke. <laughs> yeah. what percentage of smes i think because you had said about 10 percent of businesses are using that um she was saying what what percentage of smes businesses are included in that 10 percent and uh, yeah. the 10% of those who use, they wanted to know to take it a lot further and I think um, once we realize that things will flow okay, I hope that the question was, we were able to answer that question so I'm going to go on to a couple more things you can um, just check in to see if we have any additional questions now, right now um, marketing and marketing segmentation or even informatics. If we could specifically speak to that, um, Paris, and I think we're going to come down to just providing the attendees with some very practical ways of getting started. But there was one question here that I had about the, the extent to which geoinformatics, and I think you might have said it in some degree, but if the, you could sort of more precisely look at how using informatics can help with your segmentation. I think Larry gave an example with the pizza, sorry, Larry gave with the, the pizza company want to come into the market and you know, sort of going directly at. But is there anything else that, that it could be used for? No, absolutely No, You see what happens when you're dealing with a, 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 a weird question. Now, um, Napoleon Bonaparte <laughs> said, you know, where is the, is, 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 is the most important question, right? Strategically, tactically, it's all about the where. And then from that, you can figure out the how and the what and the why or whatever. The, 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 now that you know where, where also has scales. We're talking about Jamaica, we're talking about parish, we're talking about community, we're talking about property, we're talking about a room in your house. All of these are different scale scales of space, right? So when you are able to begin to discriminate by space, by where, you are now able to begin then to discriminate by sector, you can discriminate it by size of business, market, demographics, you know, income bracket, all of those things are going to be important. But where these people are is going to be an important element. Where your risks are is going to be an important element. Where your opportunities are. And a very important element to be consistent in, in terms of the fundamental um, characteristics of any business. Businesses are supposed to make money, reduce their costs, and to be compliant. And now we're going to be talking about a post-COVID world where compliance is going to take all different kinds of 
dimensions and you know health and safety and sanitize this and that and spacing and mask and all these things regulation and compliance is going to be a whole different different ball game going forward we need to figure out how do you incorporate though the logistics of mass the logistics of all of these additional supplies and so on where how is that going to operate reducing costs is important and and, and, and and increasing sales through these new opportunities you can't really have you know delivery options without understanding the logistics of delivery provide information on your customer you have information that is available out there if you have a hundred people in your community and you have a thousand people in your loyalty card that tells you something people from outside coming to you right if it's the other way around then you're really a local business you know you can begin to figure stuff out using the where but um but but again again i defer to land in terms of the, the operationalizing and in the field components of this <laughs> Well, I, I tell you, with respect to segmentation and marketing, I think one of the new normals that's going to come about over the next couple of years, if it is that we don't get a, a, a solution to this crisis, marketing of persons who supply, for example, the supermarket chain, a lot of their marketing happens in supermarket, tasting new product launches in the aisle displays, you know, a lot of activity goes on in the supermarket space. A lot of activity goes on in squares and on the road, you know, in halfway tree, and, that, and that's where people really do their marketing activity. Now, a percentage goes there, a percentage goes to social media, some go on radio and TV, etc., etc. But I think that whole landscape is going to change. Curbside parking, I'm sure, you know, if you had a supermarket and you used to do a thousand persons a day walking through, you maybe now don't do what, a hundred or two hundred. So I think the whole landscape of both the retail sector and the, 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 the brand building sector is going to change. Now in America, for example, in the States, you have Amazon. So if you, do, if you wear a particular type of shirt, yeah. you know, brothers, you know the size and you know you can buy a medium, extra large or whatever, and you know it's going to fit. But if you want to switch to Penguin, you're not going to know how Penguin fits. So in America, you can send it back at no charge, but if you order it in Jamaica, what's going to happen? The whole retail space, the whole landscape, you know, how people market, how people operate, you know, the supermarkets. I mean, these guys have big overheads, you know, they have, what, 10, 20, 30,000 square feet air condition blasting, you know, and if when you reduce the number of persons, the easiest one is the airlines, you know, they're not going to be able to have a full plane buses, trains. I mean, the whole landscape of every business, unless we get this thing under control, it's really a new normal going forward. And there are going to be opportunities in certain areas, and some workplaces will never make it back. But it's going to be interesting. And I think data and really looking at things with fresh eyes and, you know, not being stuck to what was, but what can be and where you can go. And I think that's the message, you know, Harry is saying, the where. You know, just come and break the shell and just open up your possibilities and look forward and look at it with clear, fresh eyes. Right. Um, okay, so I'm going to acknowledge. And also, there was a, an idea about businesses developing their own communities. Um, Larry, I don't know if you want to respond to that comment. Businesses should also develop their communities as far as. Um, I think he was responding to, I don't know if Dwayne could just kind of elaborate what part he was speaking to there. That sounds like a CSR um, comment. Um, but just to, in the meantime, until he clarifies, I, I, just to add to the segmentation um, question, one thing, one of the things that, that I've noticed, or we have noticed at Blue, that is that understanding even understand the need to the segmentation and, and, and primarily understand the difference between their customers and the consumers. So, and, and how you market to the customer versus the consumer after understanding that. So, you know, um, in, in Larry's business, the, the, the customer are the parents that are buying the sweets and the confectionery, but the consumers are the kids. So who do you as a business market? Do you, do you get the kids to influence the parents who are the customers or do you influence the customers um, 
to make the purchases. So, you know, that, that's one area of segmentation. And maybe Larry can also comment on that. And then also, since Larry mentioned the supermarkets, just throwing out an important, um, well, not important, there's some insights that we found last year. In, in reviewing some supermarket data, um, you know, we, we realized what they call the average weight of purchase decreased, which is essentially the basket size or the amount of items that consumers um, purchase at the supermarket, but the frequency of visits increased. And after doing some more research and understanding, it was as a result of the plastic bag. Because if you think about it, people are now going into supermarkets, um, they, they, they've left their bags, they don't want to purchase one, so they're really just purchasing what it is that they need and they're walking out with items in their hands. Um, but it also means that they, as a result of that, they, that they're going back to the supermarket two or three times a week. And and, I, and that is true for even in my own circumstance. I'm always leaving my, my bags, right? Yeah. Um, so you know, I, think, I think that's a very, very good point. And if I could comment here, right? Because I think one could one knows that the supermarkets, maybe at Crossroads, is a lower till check than one in Ligony and I think we have online I'll call her out Catherine Kennedy the general manager of High Low and um, you know she really would have the insights because you are correct you know people are you know with this bad thing and I know that downtown you know and uptown you have a different somebody would want to spend 10 or 20 thousand I mean you just um you just put it in a box <laughs> that's what I do when I forget my bag or they just Put it right in the car, I'll just pack it out when I get home because I forget the bag all the time. I afford, you can afford the two hundred dollars to get a bag every time. There are many no, things. No, 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 I don't do that. I'm saying I don't buy any more bag. I just tell them to bring it out and just put them in the car on the seat and I'll pack it out. <laughs> because I can't afford to buy a bag every time. Alright, so Dwayne uh, first let me apologize. Um Doctor Leo I he had to run and so he's no longer with us, but we do still have Larry and Laren, who, who can um, respond to the questions that you might have. I think Duane did make a, a... Okay, so he added to the point. I'm just going to read it. He says, businesses should increase revenues, okay, reduce profits, etc., but also focus on developing their communities. Okay. Um, okay, I think I kind of understand where he's going there now in terms of using that data to grow that community base that they have. Right. So the, the thing I wanted to get to know, um, Larry, especially, is yeah, we, we've talked about it, and I'm sure many business people that are in attendance now would be looking and thinking, okay, yeah, I can see how I could use this data and, and so on and so forth. But getting started is the thing. And to me, my first question is, how accessible or expensive is this service to? To, to, to begin to the, bring that into my organization. Obviously, that's a cost I have to think about if I'm thinking about surviving now and making plans for the future. Lauren, how do we go forward with accessing the kind of data you're talking about? Sorry, Dr. Leo, are you not here to respond to access geoinformatics and, and how, it, how affordable that is? So, so, so like I said, you know, of the mission, our mission at Blue Dot is, is to, is to, A, is to, uh, change the culture of that good, good, good making, um, good decision making, you know, or that, that instinct decision making that, that we're accustomed to. Um, so we've, we've, through technology, we've, we've facilitated or enabled the massive reductions in the cost of market research. But before I get into that, I, you know, like, like I, was, I started to say earlier, there are several ways in which companies can today just start to, 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 to better understand their customers. One of them is social media. So social media is your largest focus group. You have a lot of companies who have pages, um, who have Instagram pages, Twitter accounts, Facebook pages, who aren't even um, engaging with their customers um, in that manner. You know, people leave comments, they mention you, uh, and 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 we're we're culturally, you know, um, especially you know, uh, millennials and and Gen Zs, they, we are we're, they are accustomed to find someone um, or an or some business that that can help you to understand what it is that you have exist, you know, the, the existing data. There's there's several uh, a lot of insight that you can get from just looking at what uh, your existing data. 
Um, and then outside of that, it would be also thinking about, you know, what decisions do you need to make now that you can't make because you don't have the data. And then once you determine that, then you put in the, the systems in place that data. So if it is that you want to be able to target um, uh, to the hyper targeting, then you need to be able, you need to be collecting profile information on your customers. So basic demographics, but also interests, likes, etc. Um, an example that I always give is, you know, the, the supermarket that I shop at. Um, every Friday, I purchase honey bunches of oats, right? And and the supermarket, they are collecting my, they do have a loyalty program, so they are collecting my, my, my information. But yet, they've never ever sent me any promotional material for milk or some other type of cereal or some, some other product in the cereal category, all right? So we do have a lot of businesses here who are currently who currently have these databases. They're just not mining them or, or analyzing the data sets. Um, but to answer your question specifically, um, Colando, we at Blue Dot, like I said, through technology, we have we have made it one of our points of duty to to reduce the cost of market research. Um, um, so through our communal platform, which is the online panel that I mentioned earlier, we can now do studies for as little as 120,000 Jamaican dollars, um, which is unheard of. Average research traditionally costs anywhere between 1.6 million and upwards. But we've, we've brought the cost of, of market research down um, significantly. Um, of course, that's for a smaller um, sample size. But, you know, and, and again, there is yes. multimodal ways of collecting the data that we want. It could just be observational studies. One one very famous, and I'll close now, um, popular observational study that is done is um, cigarette companies, for example, they will they will literally send tea out on, on streets Hello? near bars and have them pick up the cigarette box and then come them, right? That also tells them competitor information. So you have one craving, you may have a bag, a bag full of cigarette butts, and you have Hello? 20 million, 10 matter on, then you know what the market share is, is from that. So there's several, several ways that. that, that they can. They're fighting or addressing this issue of COVID 19 spread. Uh, and the data is actually able to help them to make some precise decision with regard to contact tracing. And clearly, that's one of the containment measures. How do you feel about something like that happening here? Um, so I can answer this question from two, two angles. So I'm part of a group by the name of that would have. Um, you know, we're, we're doing things like building ventilators, etc., etc. And part of what we've done is we have built the app to do uh, contact tracing, right? But, but also, I get to answer your question. I think there has been a lot of fear mongering um, around data and privacy. You know, the I think the media has done a a, a terrible job at, or I say a good job at. At, at instilling, you know, the fear of, of data and, and privacy. Not that it is not an, an issue, but if you take, for example, the 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 backlash around needs, um, Facebook and Google have more information on us and are able to profile us in 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 in, in more ways than needs ever will, right? Um, they, they, they're, they're already collecting this, you know, all this, this data on us. And data, in most cases, is used as a force for good. So, one example would be, um, we have, you see the price of TVs going down, right? So, now you can get a 65-inch TV for 200, 250 US. Um, that is because the TVs are selling your usage data to companies like Netflix and HBO, etc. Um, uh, on, a, on, a, on a large scale level, but there's no private or personal data that they're collecting on it. There's no harm in them 
looking at what your patterns are, what your big consumer behavior is, what shows you're watching, and then selling that data to companies that will use that data to improve the services and the solutions that they provide to us as consumers. So, I mean, of course, one could say that at from Blue that we have a biased position, but um, you know, I, I think we need to be, we need to understand what data can be used for as a as a country and as a people. Um, and the benefits of that, and of at the same time, of course, ensuring that the data is protected and privacy is ensured and all of that. But the data can be used as more of a force for good than, than anything else. All right, thanks, Larry. Um, Larry, I don't know if you wanted to comment on the use of the that type of app to um, help with the containment, tracking, contact tracing.